So welcome to the Community IT Innovators webinar. Uh, today we're going to be talking about single sign-on or SSO. And I'm excited to have two of our experts with me today to discuss the security tool and how it can make life simpler for your nonprofit staff and for your IT and for your cybersecurity support. So if you don't know what SSO is, you've come to the right webinar. We're going to explain the concept and the advantages it can give your nonprofit. And if you're thinking about moving to SSO, we are going to help with some important points to consider as you make that decision and as you roll it out and implement it for your users. So my name is Carolyn Woodard. I'm the Outreach Director for Community IT. I'm the moderator today. I'm very happy to hear from our expert, Stephen Phil. But first, I'm going to cover our learning objectives. So our learning objectives for today are that by the end of the webinar, you should be able to learn what single sign-on is and is not, understand single sign-on's value to your organization, note the mechanics of single sign-on, uh, it's not simple sign-on, it's a little bit complicated, and learn planning considerations for rolling out SSO to your staff. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Steve to introduce himself. Sure. Thanks, Carolyn. My name is Steve Longenecker. I'm the director of IT consulting at Community IT. I've been here for 20 years or will have been in here for 20 years come September. So I'm looking forward to that anniversary. Uh, I'm pleased to talk to you about single sign-on today. Um, Phil, is, who has introduced himself in a second, is the technical expert, but I've collaborated with Phil on quite a few impl implementations now. My role has been more of the consultative and um, project management and change management uh, person uh, while Phil's done the, the actual technical work. Phil? Hi, um, Phil Oswald Cristano, and I have been with uh, Community IT for more than 24 years, and I am one of the senior project engineers um, and definitely one of the projects that I've frequently work on is uh, SSO implementation and configuration. Great, thank you so much, both of you for being here with us. And I'm really looking forward to taking advantage of your technical and change management expertise. Um, so before we begin, if you're not familiar with Community IT, a little bit more about us. We are 100% employee-owned managed services provider. So we provide outsourced IT support. We work exclusively with nonprofit organizations, and our mission is to help nonprofits accomplish their missions through the effective use of technology. We are big fans of what well-managed IT can do for your nonprofit. We serve nonprofits across the United States. We've been doing this for over 20 years. We are technology experts and are consistently given the MSP 501 recognition for being a top MSP, which is an honor we received again in 2024. But more than being technology experts, we're also experts in how nonprofits work, what values are important to you, and what you need from your IT. We um, Nonprofits are actually the only reason that we do this work. So I wanna remind everyone that for these presentations, community IT is vendor agnostic. So we only make recommendations to our clients and only based on their specific business needs. And we never try to get a client into a product because we get an incentive or a benefit from that. But we do consider ourselves a best of breed IT provider. So it's our job to know the landscape, the tools that are available, reputable and widely used. And we make recommendations on that basis for our clients based on their budget needs, their business priorities, and sorry, their budget, which is always a big need. We got a lot of good questions at registration. So we're gonna try and answer as many of those as we can today, but anything that we can't get to, I'm gonna ask our experts to give us some written thoughts and I'll append those to the transcript. Steve, what is single sign-on? What is this thing that this whole <laughs> webinar is about? Sure. So uh, the idea of single sign, well, the, the idea is that we have all of us now in this world of internet connectivity started using web applications, software as a service, and we have a bunch of them, right? So whether it's Zoom or Slack, your HR platform, your payroll platform, Salesforce, whatever, all of these different third-party applications would traditionally each have their own uh, I, I, username and, and password and identity user database, and they each maintain their own. So you have one username, it might be the same username, but it might be your email address that you use over and over again. But each of them has their own password 
and maybe you use the same password for each of them, but you know that if you change the password for one, it doesn't affect the passwords for the other because they're all separate. And you shouldn't use the same password for each of them because if one gets compromised, then all of your systems get compromised. Um, and we all know that already. The idea of single sign-on is that instead of having each of those applications maintain their own database of identities, you tell them to trust your own identity provider, which is shorthand for that is IDP. And we'll use that abbreviation, I'm sure, um, in this uh, rest of this webinar. But you tell them, hey, trust my IDP. My IDP is going to authenticate my organization's users. We're going to trust the IDP. And if the IDP says, yes, you can have access to this third-party application, then, then the application will let them in. Uh, they don't have to put in a separate password. They just use the, the password that they use to log on to the IDP. So the analogy for this, the real-world analogy for this might be, let's say you're a student at a university. Oh, I love the graphics. I haven't really looked at these before, Carolyn. Thanks for adding these. You're a student at a university. There's a gym. There's a cafeteria. There's you know dorms, labs, all of these things. And wouldn't it be nuts if each of those facilities had to maintain their own list of, of, of students' names and what maybe pictures so they made sure that the students' names matched the actual person who's walking in? It's a lot easier if there's an agreed upon source of identity that might be the, the university security office that issues each student and faculty member and staff person a lanyard. And that lanyard is basically trusted by all of these different facilities. So as a university student, you can get into the gym with your lanyard, you can get in the cafeteria with your lanyard. You might even be able to get into the library across town that's not owned by the university, but has reciprocity with the university for access. And you can walk into that. Interestingly enough, maybe it doesn't get you into the chemistry lab. Chemistry lab is kind of a dangerous place. You're not a chemistry student. You're not on the list. Even though there's no list, that lanyard is not a known student. And similarly, it gets you into your dorm, but not the dorm across the, the common because uh, that's a, another place where there's sort of sensitivity and you want to sort of limit access. So that's the real world example of what single sign on is. Um, Phil, you're going to talk a little bit here about um, more some of the more details. SSO is not a password manager. So just like what Steve was saying, you know, this is kind of like a transition between using physical key on campus to open different different uh, section of uh, of the campus to using a key card where these days student, you know students is issued with a, a key card that can open all based on what you're allowed to open and not. Uh, so SSO is not a password manager. Um, with uh, with the password manager, you have the you know the, the the master login, and that unlock the database that help you log into to other places. But with single sign on, uh, the authority relies on the IDP itself. Uh, so the individual applications don't actually necessarily uh, process the login, but the identity provider will, will do that. Uh, so it works hand in hand and the IDP is uh, the, you know, the, the authority. Um, now the HRIS, HR Information System, some of them would like and would prefer if possible to become the IDP because it is HR. Um, and you know some of them provide synchronization with other uh, IDP, uh, such as Okta, Antra, or Google Workspace. Uh, however, the synchronization uh, don't always work both ways uh, because of the you know the security of HR, where you know it should not be open to to everyone. We list some of the most common SSO identity providers here on this slide. That was a question that came up in the pre-registration. Um, uh, people asked whether Google Workspace could be an SSO provider, and it can. Microsoft 365 is a very popular one because you already are in there. I don't believe you have to pay anything extra for, 
or or do you, Phil? Can you remind uh, me? You you don't uh, you don't. S S O comes with uh, with the most basic with the lines. basic line. That's what I that's what I remembered. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and then Okta uh, does have some charity pricing available. Um, it's it more or less made its bones as an identity provider, whereas uh, Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace sort of I wouldn't say they tacked it on at all because it's a very robust um, and both of those platforms. But they're obviously their 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 most basic mission is to provide a bunch of services, identity being just one of them. Okta is kind of what they are as an identity provider, um, and so they've they've really um, focused on that, and that focus uh, does have some value. We have someone in the um, in the chat mentioning that Okta gives fifty free licenses to nonprofits. Yeah, that... yeah. All right. So, do we want to move on to the next um, segment, guys? Sound good? I think so. Yeah, we could say a lot more about that HR information system because it's kind of an interesting um, uh, tension between sure. HR, where it does make sense that that the sort of the the system of record of who's in your organization and who is not, and when you're first onboarding a new person, that's you start in HR. So wouldn't it make sense that everything flows from that? But traditionally, HR systems aren't as strong on the IT side. Now that might change in the years ahead, but right now we would say you're probably better off using a system that's born and bred in the IT world um, for your SSO. Wouldn't you agree with that, Phil? That at this point, yeah. that's the case? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. We have a good question before we move on um, from the audience that many websites ask if you wanna use your Google sign-in sign -in to sign into them. Is that SSO if you're using Google? Rich, you are uh, you're you're killing good me here. Question. Um, good to talk to you, Rich. We had a slide on this and we cut it out for for the sake of brevity, but it's a great question. It is not the same. That's considered social um, log ones, and it's sort of above the above the level of your organization's IT department and the configurations and governance that you have with single sign on. It's more an agreement between, say, Slack and Google. Um, where the companies Slack and Google have agreed to trust Google for an identity, but it's kind of like at that level, at, and you don't have the control points that you would with with true single sign-on. So we're not, we wouldn't say that you should be strongly encouraging the use of social. Um, I'm not sure that it's harmful per se, but it's certainly not the same thing as SSO and doesn't have some of the, and I'm about to talk about the value of SSO to your organization. It, social doesn't have any anywhere near as many of these value points. Yeah, and and also as SSO is configured, some of them allow you to disable other forms such as you know social, uh, so that you can control that a little bit. And I I sort of uh, if you people thought I was being mean to Rich for asking a question. Rich and I go back a ways. We worked on a number of projects together, so I'm a little too familiar with him. So I apologize. I will not do that to anybody else. And Rich <laughs> knows that I'm, I'm, I, I think afraid. the world of him. Rich is great. <laughs> um, okay, so what is the value of SSO to your organization? You, you probably have already, 50% of you are, are thinking about doing it and 20% of you have already done it. So this is probably a quick slide here. Um, but you know, it's really great that there's this single point of access. This is good for users because once they're in, they're in, right? It's very convenient. It helps them, users, fight password fatigue instead of having to maintain a zillion different passwords um, and each one should be unique. And a password manager helps with that and that's fine. And if that's where you're at as an organization, password managers are much better than no password managers and no single sign-on. Um, but different than password managers, single sign-on provides sort of additional things that are valuable to um, your organization's IT department if they're interested in, in governance and security. Because it's a single point of access, you can see sort of everything's logged at the point at that point of access, right? So if let's say there was a breach in your in uh, in any system, you'd probably want to one you'd wonder whether that breach has passed into other systems. Maybe someone did reuse a password. Maybe there's other stuff going on. And you it takes a it's a lot of work to investigate that if you're looking at the logs of every single app separately. If you only have to look at the logs of your IDP because everything's there, um, that's very helpful. It also provides a, a control point. Um, at that single point of access, you can 
say who has access to what back to the university example you can say that they have access to the lab or they don't or to this dorm and not that dorm so that is a very powerful thing instead of having to go into each app separately and configuring all of that separately it's much easier to do it in one place um, and then of course because it's a single point of access that point of access can can you can really focus on it in terms of security and the next slide phil's going to talk about securing that that uh, log on to the idp so yes, um, again, the, the IDP is really, you know, where the authority and, and the trust is. So first of all, I, I want to say that your security when, when you have SSO configured is about as good as your how, how your IDP is configured. So uh, I, I believe there was a, a question, um, SSO and MFA, uh, the, it, it's, its relationship. So if your IDP is not secured very well, for example, don't even have MFA configured, then in terms of security, you're not really uh, that much better off. Still an improvement, but you know, you're know you still full, full, uh, vulnerable against attacks and, and, and whatnot. So it is important to make sure that the IDP is, is configured correctly and securely. Um, and when the IDP uh, is configured correctly, then it is it is good to to have it as the, the trusting point for all of the application. Um, and generally speaking, many authentication methods are uh, supported, but they don't they don't offer, you know, equal security um, because, as as we know these days, the uh, the attackers try new things all all the time, right? Uh, and and some are definitely more secure than others uh, in terms of the 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 IDP capability. Um, and um, with the IDP authentication. Uh, there's there's always a question how how often it should be renewed, um, and how you know how uh, monitoring is done. Is there alerting uh, for you know any suspicious behavior uh, and risk? So it's it's important again to to make sure the control is done correctly on the IDP. Do you guys have a um, recommendation of that? How often? Because I I feel like that's something just anecdotally that a lot of people complain about um, mm -hmm. is that, oh, I have to change my password again. Oh, I have to change my password again. Um, yeah, so this is not about how often the password needs to be changed. We wouldn't, these days, people say, if you do really secure authentication with a very strong MFA method, changing the password is actually less important than it used to be. Um, this is more about, okay, I've already logged into the IDP on this computer. Now I've closed the lid. I've done my lunch. I come back, I open it up again. Do I need to log in again? Or will it trust me because it remembers that I was just on? Or or do I need to log? And if I've, let's say it's been a week, do I need to log in again? Now, it's clear if I got on a different laptop, I should have to log in, right? That's a different laptop. But if it's the same laptop, how often do I need to sort of renew that authentication? So that's a question. There's There is so much granularity and control in these three bullet points. You can make rules that say, you know, you can trust the laptop unless it changes its location. Then we want you to, because that, that might mean that that might be an indication that the laptop has been stolen, right? So that, that's why you can't just trust the laptop forever because you don't know who's actually using a laptop. So these are not trivial um we do we have there's a lot more to say about this we probably don't have time to go into all the different mfa methods um but there's the the hackers have just gotten so much more um uh sophisticated that they are what used to be oh if you have mfa you're good to go is no longer true right. now there's actually they talk about um phishing proof mfa methods and they talk about these security 
keys that you actually have to physically plug into your computer or or connect by via Bluetooth or uh, it's called NFC, I guess, to your phone because you you actually need to have it, you know, physical proximity. Um, anyway, we can't go into all of that now, but these are these are not trivial things. It is important to understand, though, that like maybe an application, I'm just going to pick a, an application at random like um, Slack, say, you may not have nearly as many granular controls over Slack logins. You, I'm sure, have some, but if you have, if the Slack just trusts your IDP and your IDP is a good IDP, you have all that control at the IDP level. So that that's a that's that point of having the the secure being able to focus this control at, in one place rather than across a hundred different applications. Thank you so much for that clarification. I think that really that really helps. I know also, also Carolyn uh, to. To answer your question, it it depends on who is your IDP and what features are available to you. So, for example, with Microsoft, you can upgrade your security level by getting additional license, and then that will allow you to to get more uh, granular control and alerts and and classification and things like that. Um, this makes me wonder, and I know we're going to talk a little bit later about implementation, but something to think about for that is we have several people who are getting started with mm -hmm. it. And so I'm wondering if there's ways to implement it like at a at a kind of general level. And then as you get more comfortable using the IDP and the single sign-on to maybe increase that granularity. Um, so we could talk about that later. But I want to talk about, um, unless you guys have a chance to tell us, what does this look like, like when someone logs in? Right. So two different ways, generally speaking, that, that you can log into an application using single sign-on. Uh, the first way is SP-initiated or service provider-initiated. So you just go to the same service provider, and you might put in your email address as your username, like you would normally, it sees that email address and says, oh, this is an SSO. This, this email address is configured by an organization to trust this IDP. So then it just sends um, packets of information to the IDP. And so you might, if you're, let's say you're using Microsoft 365 or Azure Ident uh, Entra ID, as, I guess it's called now, as your IDP. So you're logging into Slack, but instead of seeing a Slack login up pops what looks like a microsoft 365 login window and in fact that's what it is and and you put in your your microsoft 365 password and then up pops the microsoft 365 mfa challenge that you have to like say put the number matching into your phone because that's what's happening you are actually logging into microsoft and I, if you're already logged into microsoft 365 it may be seamless you may, it may, Microsoft already knows that you've logged in and it just says to Slack, yep, yep, I know who that person is, let them in. The other way is called, is the IDP initiated. And this is pretty cool. And I think Okta does it best. It's one of the examples probably where the fact that this is Okta's focus and their reason for existing, um, they probably do it best. But where you can get these um, app dashboards, I guess, and we have Google on the bottom left, and then we've got um, Okta in the middle, and then we've got Microsoft 365's app dashboard on the upper right. But each of these is like you've, you've logged into the IDP, and then you've gone and then you've browsed to your app dashboard, if you will, or your whatever, the, the, this, this list of, of, of icons. You click on an icon and you go straight into the application, which is pretty cool. It's a, ni it's a nice way for an, for an IT department to make available all of the different resources. And of course, different tiles would be available to different people. If you're in the finance department, you have a tile for the finance system. If you're in the communications department, you have a, um, you don't. Uh, one, one thing to add uh, with the uh, service provider initiated, uh, depending on the application, there's the different behavior. For example, as soon as you put in your email address, right away, it takes you to the IDP login. While some you have to you click login with Okta or login with Entra or login with Google uh, as the IDP. So it really varies from from one to to another depending on the application. Yeah, we're seeing questions and chats about are all apps the same? So we're we're getting to the 
the, we're getting to the fact that they are not, and we're about to start talking about that. Yeah. So another part of the SSO mechanics is the protocols itself. And basically in, in plain language, that's how the application uh, talk to the IDP, right? Uh, so most IDP can can use all of the, the protocols that we, that we have in the slide, the SAML, OAuth, and you know OIDC, and and, and all this. Uh, but not all applications can use all of those. Some can use one, while others use the other. Uh, so that makes it a little bit tricky sometimes to configure because it's not all the same way. Uh, so depending on what protocols it's using and its capability, you have to configure it uh, differently. Well, and that's the sort of thing, right, that I know often when we're first working with a client, we are gathering all the information about all the apps that they're using and different teams are using, and it can be challenging to put that list together. Um, and that's a list that you have to have for SSO, it sounds like. Well, if you're going to be comprehensive, yes, but there were there were questions. Do is it like it's and we and in fact our survey, the, our poll at the beginning made a made allusion to the fact that it's not all or nothing. So you can implement SSO for the five most commonly used apps, or even for eighty percent of the apps that you use, and not necessarily. And you're going to have to actually. We'll talk about the fact that some apps don't even support SSO, mm -hmm. um, or that you might have. Uh, circumstances that constrain your ability to, to implement SSO for for apps, even if they support it. So, um, so yes, a, a list of all the apps that you want to do SSO with is as part of the implement you know, early on the implementation planning for sure. Um, and then your implement if if you're doing it great, um, start reading the knowledge base articles that hopefully those applications are providing. Hopefully. Um, if you're doing it with a partner, hopefully they've experience with those apps. I can speak from I will I will speak for Phil's experience. You know, early on, especially we were doing apps that we hadn't done before, and that will still every every implementation will still I'm sure surface apps that we've not done before, and each one's kind of a rodeo. I mean, sometimes it's really straightforward, but other times it's like, oh, this is unexpected, and you know, you have to sort of work your way through the challenges because every app is a little bit different. That'll be a theme yeah. of the next few slides. Yeah, in in fact, there there are times where you have to open a ticket with the app provider before you can even configure because they have to enable it on their end, you know, before we can even proceed. Uh, so that makes it a little bit interesting. Another part of uh, SSO, uh, one capability is user account provisioning, and what this is is, you know, traditionally when you use an application, let's just pick on Slack, you have to create the account in Slack in order for your uh, user to be able to log in uh, as part of your organization. Some application will allow uh, automatic user account provisioning. And what that means is you create the account in your IDP, say Google or Microsoft or Okta, and then uh, there's a rule that will enable you to automatically create an account in the application itself, such as Slack. Um, and then that way you it, it cuts down on the um, you know on, on your setup time because you you just need to make sure that you have enough license for for all this. Uh, and then the provisioning can 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 happen on its own. And some can even assign license. So for example, you know, like a, a workflow where you create the, the user in Okta, you add the user in the group uh, where uh, Microsoft 365 is one of the application. It can create the user automatically. And depending on which group you put it in, uh, it will provision the, the right uh, uh, license as well as the role of, of the person. Um, now, a side note, not all applications support this because again, uh, to, to do this account provisioning, uh, there's a certain protocol that need to be used and not all applications are using that protocol. So some you still have to uh, create the account manually. 
the SSO will still work, but you have to go into the application to create the account. This is great for efficiency, especially if you've got a lot of users that are coming and going, because it's not just provisioning, but deprovisioning that can, that can happen automatically. So when someone's offboarded, you just go into Okta, say, or, or, or Entra ID in Microsoft 365, go to that user, that, that, uh, that person who's leaving the organization, and you just make some configuration changes there, and it just turns off not just their, their account there, but in these other applications and, re and retrieves the license for you and all, all that stuff sort of automatically, which is great. That sounds great. I think we're going to get into this section now, which is about implementation, um, which I think is going to answer a couple of questions that are coming in, but we'll check with you after we talk about it and see if we've hit all of the questions. So Steve, I think you were going to talk a little bit more about apps. Yeah. So, all right. We've already, we've already blown the, the, the big story, which is that uh, every app is different. Um, and so when you're doing an SSO implementation, yeah, you get your list of apps you go through them. Um, some apps require um, special licensing for SSO. Uh, we'll pick on Slack again. The, the Slack is one of the, our audience, of course, cares about the fact that Slack uh, has a TechSoup available license, which is really a, a great pricing for, for nonprofits. But um, wouldn't you know it, if you want to use SSO with that Slack, you need to upgrade that license because um, now I, I find that, I, I continue to find it crazy that SSO isn't kind of a baseline uh, part of an application. At the same time, I'm sympathetic to particularly small applications that are just doing their best to like deliver the functionality that makes their application competitive in a marketplace that's, you know, tough and they always have to, they have to keep getting rid of bugs and, and delivering new features and everything else. And to suddenly like have to also add single sign on functionality on top of that, they, it's almost always on all these applications roadmaps, but I can see why that might not be the first thing that they're doing in terms of where they're investing their development dollars. Um, so not all apps even support it. Um, and then if they do support it, um, and it was just, there was just an, a, uh, someone referenced this in one of the open questions, Aziz said, you know, that they, they put off a big implementation of SSO because the apps that they wanted to do SSO with weren't supporting the automatic user provisioning and deprovisioning. And that was a big, for them, that was a big reason for even doing SSO in the first place. And, and I get that. So looking into all of these things are things that uh, you need to do sort of ahead of the implementation. Um, it's going to be hard to like know everything from, from, from the planning stage, but you can at least get a handle on does the application even support it? What protocol does it uses? Look and see whether there's um, a, a, a nice knowledge base article that's understandable about how to implement the SSO. This, is, this would normally be published on the application side, right? So if you're implementing it for Salesforce, you should be able to go to Salesforce's knowledge base and, and do a, a search for SSO. And you should be able to find, hopefully, like articles that tell you how to do SSO. Really big apps with a lot of development dollars and, and support dollars might have specific instructions for, the, for Okta versus Entra ID versus Google. Other applications are just going to have very general instructions about SSO in general, and they're going to count on you as the um, implementer to be able to uh, sort of translate that to the specific IDP that you're using. Um, and some won't have any knowledge base article at all, at all. And then you're like, okay, this is not a good sign. And, and it's not, but it doesn't mean that it can't be done, but it, it might, it's, a, it's a steeper hill for sure. So I feel like maybe for the people on this webinar who are you know, IT managers, unfortunately, there is no, you know, just switch that you can turn on. You do have to look into every app. So you need that list of your apps. You need to know um, if they support it, if they need a special license, what the ins and outs are for each one. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. you yeah. are a contact person and you are thinking about this, this would be a great question for your MSP or outsourced provider or your tech you know, department at your organization to, to ask them about. Right, and, and there's different things that you want to evaluate, right? Like an, SS, an application that's used by everybody in the organization is, has bigger bang for your buck in terms of SSO than one that's just used by two people. If it's just used by two people, maybe it's not worth doing at all. Um, or it also depends on like the the uh, risk associated with it in terms of like, well, what happens if it is breached? You know, like, like, oh, shoot, someone got into our New York Times subscription. 
and they're reading the New York Times for free, low risk, like not a big impact to your organization. You might not, you might prefer not to have that account compromised, but it's not the end of the world. They rearranged, you know, what your favorite section was. Now it's sports is at the top of the list. It shouldn't be, you know, but that's like the, that's it. Whereas if someone can break into your HR system, it's, it's, you know, game over or finance, you know, so maybe those really need to be in, in SSO where you've got that logging and that control point and all the things that we talked about before. So there's different things that you're considering as you're mapping out which app, because you might not get all your applications. You probably won't get all your applications um, and, and which ones uh, you do get and prioritize are, are going to be varying according to those considerations. And, and that's a, a good reminder that the context of SSO implementation is really security, right? So yeah. even when there is a challenge such as, uh, you know, what Aziz is talking about, where you have to upgrade license, it's important to, to uh, bring it up the chain to help people understand in the organization that the context of security so yes, it might be an additional investment that, that we need to put in, but if it reduces the security risk, it's worth it. It might need to wait until the next fiscal year maybe uh, so that it can be put in the, in the budget, but I would not just drop it completely simply because you have to upgrade the license. Um, Steve, I think, can you kind of go over this slide a little bit? Yes, quickly? yes, and it actually fits, uh, I'll try to, like, yeah. Please. Yeah, uh, it does fit in with a couple points that people have made, um, and these are these are two other additional considerations uh, in terms of your application evaluation. So, shared user accounts. I just mentioned the New York Times subscription. So, you know, famous not famously, it would, it's not stereotypically perhaps, you know, six people in the organization are in the communications department or the programs department all need to like read the New York Times uh, to just look for references to their. Uh, area of that they're pr programmatically following or whatever, and you don't want to buy six accounts. So you buy one account and then share the username and password among your six staffers. Um, that's the New York Times would frown upon that. Uh, um, but it also doesn't work with SSO, right? Because you can't you can't have those six people uh, there. There's there's no one, one to many or many to one uh, set up for the most part with, um, with SSO. So that, does, that's just not going to work. Um, we would probably tell you to buy more subscriptions since that's probably the right thing to do anyway. Um, no more to be said about that. The other one that's a troublesome spot, uh, trouble spot. So let's say that, uh, you have a, uh, finance system and that there's some, there's a, a consultant who, who does some accounting work for you, um, who doesn't have, uh, a, a login with your IDP, right? Because they're, you know, they don't need one. And as long as they're like logging into the finance system with it, with their username and password that you've given them in the finance system, that's good enough. With single sign-on, it depends on the application. Some applications allow you to use single sign-on for and the regular uh, username and password, and some say, nope, once you've turned on single sign-on, you have to use single sign-on, in which case you either can't do it for that person or you need to give that consultant a user account in your IDP. It's it's just the way, there's just certain constraints that you get into with this, and there's um, it's, it's hard to do. And with that, it's this is also where, you know, it matters which IDP you're using, because as a nonprofit organization, Microsoft 365, you're you're free to keep on creating accounts because uh, what matters is what license you apply. But in Okta, just to create an account, you need the license. So uh, another challenge with SSO implementation uh, is again each application, you know, behave very differently. So for example, with Slack, uh, when SSO is configured and enable, then the user, all, all the users basically have to do the binding between an existing account uh, with the with the IDP. And this is something that cannot be done by the administrator. So basically when it is enabled, uh, Slack will send out an email, automatic email to all the users, uh, giving them instruction on how to bind it. Um, with LastPass, for example, if you use that, 
and you configure it uh, for SSO, the user will have to re-encrypt their fault. Uh, so again, it, it requires the user to, to actually do some work to, to make just it. Just a little click or two. It's not that big yeah. a deal, but it's like, can be confusing. It just yeah. adds to your change management burden. But as, as we all know, though, with anything change management, sometimes people just completely ignore those email and then suddenly, hey, it's not working, right? right. So, um, and um, also some will, will require federation uh, like with the uh, Adobe. Um, now, change management in the SSO implementation is really important. Uh, it needs a lot of communication because first of all, people will have to do things slightly differently, you know, than the usual. And usually that alone just causes issue. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and like what you said earlier, uh, planning is very important. Getting, getting the buy-in from, uh, from management, from, uh, uh, or, or giving education to to the users, it's very important, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, and as far as strategy, uh, because each app has different impact, different change management, uh, it's always good to start with the lower stakes. Uh, so applications that are being used maybe like once a month, those are a good one to to change first. Uh, application that you know rarely use or a small only a small group of people are using. Th those are a good low hanging fruit. Uh, however, application like uh, uh, Zoom, for example, where people are using it all the time, you really have to time it and plan it correctly uh, to make sure it goes smoothly and there's no interruption. Um, and of course, we need to ask people to, to be flexible during this transition because it's not unusual that we do a configuration, we, we turn it on after testing it and something's still not quite right and we have to roll it back and, you know, nothing is perfect, so. <laughs> uh, and and also in 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 regard to planning, uh, it's it's important to know that um, even though like what Steve was saying, the application may have documentation and the IDP may have documentation. There, in in my experience, they're not always updated. Uh, sometimes the documentation are outdated, or a smaller company is bought by a larger company. Now the name changed and all the formatting suddenly change, uh, it, it can be a nightmare in that way. So the, the planning is really important um, uh, in, in order to successfully implement SSO. All true, but we I think we made it too scary. We've done this a, a bunch <laughs> of times, and once it's done, I think the users really like it. Like it is super convenient to just have one thing that they have to authenticate once and then sort of into everything at once. Um, and once, if you do start with that lower stake stuff, you know, logging into your benefits site, which you know you only have to do when you want to check your IRA account or something like that. It's like not mission critical. It's not happening all the time. Start with that stuff. Go slow. Build up people's familiarity and like experience with SSO. Then you hit the hard ones, the big ones, the ones that are, you know, but people will have familiarity with the process at that point. They're used to the communication. They've already logged into the IDP a bunch. They know how to find the, the app dashboard and, um, and, it, and it, you sort of gain some momentum uh, doing it that way. And um, it's gone really well at a number of our, with our, most of our projects and we've been, it's been fun. And while there's been always been an app or two that like makes you grind your teeth, a lot of the apps are actually quite smooth and it's no big deal. And, and it's over and done with, you know, we could, you know, Phil's done what three or four app transitions at a time sometimes, right? Like, yeah. and then, yeah, it's not that big a deal. So. Well, I will put that um, 
plug in, you know, we do have some expertise in this. When I was saying before, if you are not the technical person, um, finding somebody that you trust and can talk to about it makes sense. We have a great question in the Q&A. For small organizations already using a password manager, is SSO worth the effort? If some important apps aren't going to support SSO, you'd ha still have to use the password manager anyway for those. So especially small organizations, can you guys talk a little bit about kind of the security versus convenience trade-off there? And being able to manage it, right? Like this is an IT yeah. Yeah. item that you have to be able, keep. you have to have the capacity to manage. Yeah. So I'll, I will start with the, the second part of the question. Uh, what happened with applications that do not support SSO? So Okta, for example, uh, has, uh, uh, has what's called SWA secure web application, where it basically, Okta will act as your password manager. Uh, and in fact, you can, you can set it up so that individuals can, uh, can, uh, configure each application themselves for that, or it, it can be an application where the login is actually shared among a group of people. Uh, so there is a workaround. Microsoft has something similar. It works slightly differently, but essentially they can become the password manager. Google's implementation is a little bit differently because uh, Google wants Chrome browser to be you know, the password manager. So in a way that's built in, in there. Uh, but to answer the first question, we need to remember that again, password manager is still different than SSO, right? Because the level of um, uh, security gain that you get out of SSO is it's much more than just simply using password manager. Um, yeah. I don't know, Steve, if you have any. Issues. No, I, I everything you're saying is true. And I didn't I don't want to like enable Tresson to like uh take undue risks with his with his organization. I will say that a password manager is a lot better than no password manager. And it is a it is a it is a, a big lift for small organizations to do SSO. And I do believe that SSO is a maturing. We've seen improvements, you know, just in the last few years. It's 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 maturing it's um so i think putting it down the list of priorities is probably going to be okay for a small organization that doesn't have a you know has other things that they need to take care of but it it's but phil's point is still completely right that it's not the same they are not equivalent and we shouldn't think of them as equivalents yeah um, and, and but also, sometimes you can't you can't you just can't do it it's like too much too much right but also keep in mind that if you're already using either Google for your email or Microsoft 365 as as your platform, you already have the IDP, right? You have right. you have already half of what you need to to set this up. So uh, I would I would still consider it. Um, I wanted to go back over our learning objectives, which we hope that everyone feels. You have learned about single sign-on, what it is, what it entails. Um, you can understand the value of it to your organization. And I think we just got into some of the questions of like, we didn't even talk about costs, right? But um, you have to trade off that. What are your risks? Are, do you have some apps that are more risky than others? Do you have the capacity to, um, you know, to, to do SSO on your end? Um, and of course, as you said, like password manager is better than no password manager. So um, making sure that you have some training and people who are conscious of security uh, in everything that they're doing, whether or not you have um, single sign-on in there. We learned some of the mechanics of how it works. Of course, we can only scratch the surface, um, but I hope that people feel like you could understand what we're talking about. If you have more questions, please get in touch with us. We love to talk about this sort of thing. And then we touched at the end on a lot of those considerations in the change management. Thank you, Phil, for sharing uh, that with us and just making sure you're communicating and telling people why and practicing on the smaller apps and then doing like the Zoom or the apps that people are using every day that if they can't log in, they're gonna freak out. 
Um, I want to go really quickly to just let you know that next month I'm going to be talking with our CEO, Johan Hammerstrom, and our Director of Information Systems and Technology, Pat Sprahe, about a common fear in nonprofit technology, the fear of missing out or FOMO. So we're going to talk about ways to make strategic IT decisions at your organization, whether or not you're the IT person and ways of embracing change or learning to avoid shiny object in syndrome with new technology, particularly AI. But I think, you know, SSO is another good example and your cybersecurity of making sure you have a plan and that you're working with that plan um, when new bright things come in and maybe you want to do them. So you have a way to evaluate what you're putting in place. So that's going to be at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific on um, <laughs> August 21st. Um, so I just want to thank you, Phil and Steve, for helping us out with understanding what it even is and then some of these considerations. And I love getting into some of the technical considerations as well. So Phil, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks everyone who spent an hour with us today. Really appreciate it. And we'll let you go on your way. Thank you so much. Bye.